Welcome to Science Coach to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. On our screens, fictional, anthropomorphic cats and dogs have a wit and purpose and sense of self that my good dog just lacks. What you talked about, Lisa Beth? Dolphins, on the other hand, are often as creative and personable in real life as they are on the screen. Professor Diana Reese, marine mammologist, cognitive psychologist, and director of the Animal Behavior and Conservation Program at CUNY's own Hunter College, is here to explain why. Diana, welcome to the show. Hi, Lisa Beth. Thanks for having me. In the HBO series Made for Love, Hazel Green is saved from captivity by a fellow prisoner, a dolphin named Zelda. In the fiction, Zelda is self-aware. What are the hallmarks of self-awareness? So um, I've been studying dolphins, and we've been putting mirrors in front of dolphins to understand how they'll react. And some of the hallmarks of self-awareness when you put a mirror in front of an animal is seeing how they behave when they see this reflection of self. What we find is that they first act as if they're seeing another dolphin. So they show social behavior as if there were a dolphin in front of them. But then it changes, and it changes in a way where they look like they're testing the contingencies of their own behavior. So if you've ever seen any of the Groucho Marx footage where they're kind of doing unusual repetitive behaviors, kind of moving back and forth, exactly what you see with dolphins. And it's they're testing the contingencies of their own behavior. If I move this way, what's that guy doing? But then it shifts one more time, and what you see is they'll start reacting as if they know it's themselves. The light bulb kind of goes on, and they start reacting in a way that shows that they are now aware it's them, that it's their face, their body in the mirror. So they'll actually examine parts of their body that they can't see without the mirror, looking closely at their eyes. I mean, we can identify with this because we do the same thing. <laughs> They look at their eyes close up. Exactly. <laughs> they're, not putting make they're not putting makeup on in front of them here. But they look at their eyes or they'll open their mouths wide and look inside their mouths. They can't touch themselves because dolphins are non-handed. But they'll even look at their genitals in the mirror. So it's quite interesting to see. But then they also will bring objects over and watch what it looks like when they're playing with them. They may create uh, bubble rings or different kinds of air, um, air forms and watch themselves blowing bubbles. It's quite fascinating. And are most animals self-aware? No, actually only a small handful of other species are self-aware. So it's been shown in all of the great apes. We demonstrated it in the dolphins. We also demonstrated it in Asian elephants. It's been shown in magpies as well. Magpies are a member of the crow family and they're, they have really big brains also relative to their bodies. All the animals that show it, including humans, have pretty big brains relative to their bodies. The mirror test was developed by psychologist Gordon Gallup, Jr. in 1970, and Dr. Reese's book is called The Dolphin in the Mirror. So how important is this mirror test? It's been an important test because, you know, what for years we've known that we can't get inside the minds of other animals. We can't see how they think. The mirror, ironically, lets us see reflections, all puns intended, reflections of their mental states. Mm -hmm. And we see how their thinking changes over time when they have experience with mirror exposure. We see it with humans, we see it with apes, and then we saw it with both dolphins and elephants, these same stages of realization of self-awareness. Trapped in similar situations, Zelda, the made-for-love dolphin, has empathy for Hazel, the human being. Do real dolphins have that capacity for empathy and self-reflection? It seems so, and we're not alone in this capacity. Um, dolphins will show that they give caregiving behavior, they'll come to a the aid of others in need. There are these ancient stories about a sailor, Arian, who was thrown overboard, and he reported that a dolphin came to his rescue and carried him back onto land. This is an ancient myth that's been substantiated over the years by people reporting that they've been saved at sea by dolphins. So you might argue, well, maybe this is just a stimulus response, that these are air-breathing mammals like us, dolphins are air-breathing mammals like us. Perhaps it's adaptive if they hold up other air-breathing animals. Mm. But you know what? It doesn't seem to be the case because they show great flexibility in this. They don't always do it. And it's, that's, that's really important. It's not just they see a flailing mammal at the surface and hold it up. It doesn't always happen. It seems to be very selective. We're very selective in many ways in who we share our empathy with also. Yeah, this is a hallmark of our humanness, 
mere self-recognition, empathy. And it seems that empathy and mere self-recognition and a high level of social awareness seems to go hand in hand, or I might say flipper to flipper, <laughs> with mere self-recognition and this high level of self-awareness. And again, are these traits we see in a lot of species? No, not at all. Again, it's just this small handful of species. There are some, there's some evidence for empathy in dogs and a few other species, yet we don't see them responding to the mirror in a way that we would call self-aware. Oh, so it's that combination of empathy and self-awareness that really makes some species y Yes, you show it. Yes, it's quite interesting. The species that um, have been tested and have shown mirror self-recognition also show empathy and also have large brains compared to their bodies. You know, dolphins, by the way, have the second largest brain relative to their bodies to us humans. It's called the EQ or encephalization quotient. But still, we don't know this, the recipe that is, that's necessary to show mere self-recognition. We're looking at what correlates with it right now. What does that say about humanness? It, that perhaps we're not as unique mm. as we think. And I think the more we're learning about the minds of other animals by watching their behavior, we realize that there's a continuum that we used to think there were, there were these traits that we had, these characteristics that were just unique to us. We're tool users. We used to be the only tool users. Certainly, there are many species that use tools, even the non-handed dolphins. They actually use tools. They use marine sponges to protect their beaks or their rostrums when they're foraging in rough terrain. They create their own kinds of tools where they'll blow bubble rings to make nets around fish and capture them, or dolphins will create rings of mud to, to capture animals so they can manipulate their environment in this way. Mere self-recognition was once considered unique to us humans, um, and empathy. So we're finding a lot of shared abilities. I would hope that these recognition of our lack of uniqueness would make us more empathetic to these other species. Unfortunately, a lot of our behavior and the behavior of other cultures in the world, we don't, it doesn't seem to indicate we're always that empathic. Mm -hmm. I hope it changes. As the show progresses, the dolphin Zelda invents creative solutions to solve the problems around her. Are real dolphins creative? They're incredibly creative. Um, I'll give you a couple of really specific examples. So um, one of the earliest studies I did, in fact, when I first got my PhD, I got my first video camera. It was a beta camera. This is showing how old I am. And I lifted the beta camera to a dolphin pool, and I watched as this female dolphin named Shiloh blew out of her blowhole, which is like they're not, is their nostril, a silver ring of air. I watched as the same dolphin went to the bottom of the pool, blew another ring of air that was slowly rising to the surface, quickly blew a second ring, which met with the first ring, formed a hoop, and she swam through it. They can create their own objects of play. And dolphins, like other animals, are playful. But this was the first case we had where we showed that, that an, a dolphin actually created their own object of play from something they created from their own body. Since then, Many, many facilities have shown dolphins playing with making water snakes and bubble rings and, and things like that. When we did the study, uh, it was in the 80s, and, and we didn't even have YouTube videos then. Now, if you look at YouTube, you'll see bubble rings by dolphins all over the YouTube. Yeah. Uh, they're also very creative in their foraging abilities. They find ways of finding food. They can find food by themselves, but they work collectively or cooperatively, like us, in Made for Love, Zelda is able to communicate with humans via a sci-fi quasi-magic cranial implant decoding her clicks and whistles into human speech. In real life, have we been able to decode dolphin speech? No, <laughs> I'm saying that quickly. <laughs> um, so this is what my quest has been since I was a graduate student. I'm, I'm really sort of obsessed with trying to decode the whistles and other sounds that dolphins make. They make a cacophony of sounds. They do whistles like um, that's just, I can't hold myself back when I have a mask about this. They do all sorts of other sounds like squawks, and they use echolocation or sonar to navigate and to get images back from their environment. And we don't know the smallest unit of sound that they're, that they're using. We don't know how the signals are organized. I've been focusing a lot on their whistle communication. What we do know is that each dolphin has their own unique 
what we call signature whistle or contact call. Many animals do this, where they produce a particular kind of call. It's thought to function perhaps as a name, and they can identify others. They can they use it repeatedly. Uh, we don't actually know the function to the animal itself of that call, but they produce all these other signals, and we don't have a good idea about the ordering of those signals and what may be encoded in terms of meaning. And if you're not a linguist, this concept, uh, if you're not a linguist but you like movies, yeah. this concept of the smallest uh, bit of communication symbol is something that was really addressed in the movie Arrival, that they were, the linguist was trying to determine what was the base of communication. Is that what, is that kind of what's happening with dolphins? Yeah, with that's, what, dolphins? that's what we're trying to do. And so I have a background in linguistics as well. And yeah, you, need, you kind of need this cool toolkit, <laughs> you know, bioacoustics, linguistics, social behavior, to understand another species. So do dolphins communicate with symbols? Well, we gave them symbols. We don't know if they naturally communicate with anything that's symbolic. But what we did many years ago as part of this decoding quest is I created an underwater keyboard for dolphins. You may say, why would you give a keyboard to a dolphin? They're not handed but they can use their rostrums, the beak, oh. to touch these symbols. So it was a keyboard that had three symbols across three rows, visual symbols. If they would hit a key, they would hear a whistle like <whistles> and we would give them a ball. If they hit a different shape key, they would hear a different whistle like <whistles> and we'd give them a tickle or a rub. And we asked the question, if we gave them the opportunity to have choice and control, what would they do? What we found was they showed self-organized learning without us explicitly training them. And this was not for food reinforcement. They just learned the contingencies of using the different symbols. And they started to imitate the sounds almost immediately. They started to use them in association with the objects or activities. And it really resembled the stages of early child language acquisition. It was really exciting. Wow. Yeah. But it gave us a clue into how they may be using their own signals. What's happening with the underwater keyboard now? Well, it was very limited. We did this in the mid 80s and published in the early 90s. And we were really limited by the technology. So of now- Of the keyboard. Of the keyboard. It was interfaced with an Apple II computer by fiber optic cables. We published this and it was, it was well received. But for years, I've been wanting to do something that's more updated. Now I collaborate with Dr. Marcella Magnasco, who's a biophysicist at the Rockefeller University. And we've created a dolphin touchscreen, a four by eight optical touchscreen where we detect their touches by optics with a camera, very high tech. We call it the D-pad, like the dolphin pad. And on a very large four by eight foot screen, we've asked the question, how will they use, how will they use this if we give them choice and control, what will we find? And we've actually put up a video of the first time the dolphins actually ever had the touch screen. We gave them a program that we call Whack-A-Fish, where they're little fish going across the screen. And the very first moments that a young male dolphin saw the screen, he immediately started touching all the fish. It was like watching a teenager at a screen. This is a non-technological species. In Made for Love, Zelda is not played by a real bottlenose dolphin. Zelda is the wholly digital creation of VFX supervisor Peter Crosman, who, in an article for The Wrap, described Zelda saying the creators wanted her in a depressed, domesticated state. In real life, those depressed and domesticated go hand in hand, or flipper and flipper, for dolphins. We don't really know. I mean, in facilities that have dolphins, and there are many different kinds of facilities, some are very bad and some are quite good. It brings up the whole issue of um, how do we know the emotional state of dolphins. And there's some studies that have been done that really look at what we call cognitive bias or try to get a sense of the state of the animal by giving different kinds of tests. It's still an area that's really hard to assess. I mean, we can look at the health of animals. Animals are reproducing in, in uh, facilities, but that's not always a measure of welfare. Some animals seem, f smaller dolphins, smaller species like dolphins, seem to be well-adjusted or well-acclimated. But I really hope that based on what we're learning in our science, that perhaps we think about not taking dolphins ever again from the wild. Most facilities in the United States do not do that anymore. Dolphin, in fact, I can say facilities in the United States do not get dolphins from the wild anymore. The dolphins that are in those facilities have been born in captivity over the past 20 years. But unfortunately, there are many places that are still capturing dolphins from the wild. And I hope that really stops. We, I think if we start applying our science to policy decisions, hopefully we can stop that. 
The 1973 film Day of the Dolphins, based on a French novel called A Sentient Animal, starred George C. Scott and a dolphin named Fa. In the flick, Fa is kidnapped, strapped into a harness, and forced into an underwater plot to blow up a yacht owned by the President of the United States. Does Fa speak to Pa? Pa! No! It was supposed to be science fiction. But in 2019, a white beluga whale swam into the Norwegian port of Hammerfest and... You want to take the story over from here? Sure. This is a white beluga whale that we're now calling Waldemir. And this whale was clearly trained in a military program. The whale itself is a very friendly whale, but he shows some very interesting behaviors. For example, he immediately goes to boats. He will find ropes and wrap them around propellers. This is a trained behavior. And in our own country, we've had a program with our military where dolphins have been trained to go into warfare situations, like in the Persian Gulf, where dolphins were trained to do surveillance in the Persian Gulf. There are programs like this that exist. The unfortunate situation for Valdi, as we call him, is that he solicits human interaction now. We don't know if he left the program on his own or he was released, but no one's claimed him. So now he's in Norwegian waters. People are enthralled with this animal. They're fascinated. Um, but he's alone, and that's unusual yeah. for a whale. So we formed a group called One Whale. I'm part of that group. I'm a science advisor for One Whale. The town of Hammerfest, where he was hanging out primarily, just opened their arms and hearts to him, and they've proposed to build a reserve. Mm -hmm. What's remarkable is Norway is one of the few last whaling countries. So to have them want oh. to build a reserve is a sea change. Oh. So we're very excited about this. We're working in partnership with them, and we're really hoping to build the first beluga whale reserve so we can protect him. Sure. Children who fall in love with a whale are not going to want to hunt them. Right. We need to make, make the world fall in love with whales. And by sharing our scientific knowledge, I think that that's one step. By coming face to face with these whales and seeing who they are, because they are who's, I think people will fall in love with them. We have to share that information. These are empathic animals like us. We have to feel that empathy back. What was Valdi wearing when he was discovered? Oh, he came in with a military harness. It said, property of Russia. And it was printed in, in, in English, but it was property of Russia. So we know he came from a Russian military institute. And it had, a, it had a mount for a camera. And this is the typical kind of harness that's used in military operations. He's a lovely whale. He solicits uh, rubbing from people. <laughs> he follows people. The good news is he's eating on his own. The bad news is he often uh, goes to salmon farms and uh -huh. solicits human interaction from the workers. And even though they like him, there's so much they can do because they're supposed to be working. So we really do need to protect him. And uh, I hope this will happen in the near years. We're looking for funding to help get this reserve built. In Greek mythology, when pirates try to take the god Dionysus prisoner, it does not go well for the pirates. Dionysus throws them overboard, but Feeling merciful, before they hit the water, he turns them into dolphins. In that story, dolphins were once seen as humans, and they can seem very human-like, but in many of your lectures, you talk about the otherness, the alienness of the dolphin. Are they aliens? They're non-terrestrials, is what I call them, because they're totally aquatic. They're not aliens, but what, what's so fascinating about them is, even though their body forms are so different, because they've adapted to life in the sea, they're streamlined. They've lost a lot of what we call the morphologies of other animals. They don't have ear, external ears. Okay, um, They don't have arms and legs. They're streamlined like fish. Yet, despite these profound differences, they are so like us in so many ways. First of all, they have long-lived friendships. Mm. They live in what we call fission-fusion societies. So do elephants. So do apes. So do we, where we make strong bonds with certain individuals. And then we have other strong bonds with other individuals, and we collaborate and cooperate with each other in different con conditions. They have to spend a long time raising their young. Their youngsters have to be enculturated. They have to learn the culture. They learn by observing. They learn by watching and observing. Um, what's really fascinating is they, again, they show empathy. They show mere self-recognition. They're now showing the capacity to use symbols in studies like we've done with keyboards. 
other colleagues of mine have shown that dolphins can understand gestural sentences that they're taught. So this- we What's should, a gestural sentence? A gestural set, my colleague Lou Herman taught them to comprehend sentences where they say, fetch ball to hoop. And they can decode that sequence of gestures and show that they can comprehend by doing the corresponding behaviors. They can give them novel sentences where they reorganize those gestures. Um, the, those animals are no longer alive. This was done several years ago. But it really opened our eyes to the capacities of these animals. Mm. Again, we are not alone. In Made for Love, the dolphin Zelda and the human Hazel have similar cranial implants, but are dolphin brains like ours? Dolphin brains are large and complex like our brains are. And as I said, they're second largest relative to their body size to our brains, larger than even ape brains relative to their body size. Right? What's different is how the brain is organized. They don't have quite the distinctions that we have, and we don't know the meaning of that. Another thing that's different about their brains, and this is true for elephant brains, is that the neurons in the brain, the cells in the brain, the neurons, are larger and less densely packed. But we don't know the meaning of that. It may just be a different brain structure. We, we're still at the infancy of trying to of understanding the significance of these differences uh, in structure, in architecture in the dolphin brain. But again, they are showing intelligent behavior nonetheless. In ancient Greece, killing a dolphin was punishable by death. In our modern world, dolphins are hunted without mercy. In 2009, the Oceanic Preservation Society secretly filmed the capture and slaughter of dolphins in a secluded cove in Japan. The film, The Cove, educated the world to the brutality of the hunt, focusing on one city in Japan. Our guest, Diana Reese, was the scientific advisor on that film. What do you think was the most important thing about The Cove? Yeah, I actually told the director about the situation in Taiji, Japan. I have been working with many scientists and other organizations like zoos and aquariums nation, worldwide, not just nationwide. Um, and we wrote letters to the government of Japan trying to stop this horrendous practice of killing dolphins in the most brutal and horrendous way it continues today. Um, I was able to speak with the director, told him about this. And I think what was really important is to share this, this situation with the world. And it really opened up the global eyes to this. Unfortunately, it still continues today. Starting every September through April, the drive hunts massacre these dolphins. They herd them into a cove where they're slaughtered. And I, I, it's, it's absolutely inhumane. It continues today. And I think what we really need to still do is use, uh, use everything we can do politically, um, cultural, we have to communicate po through politics, through culture, uh, through economics, and through our scientific knowledge and continue to argue that these drives must stop. The brutality of the drive is, is kind of shocking because as I saw the movie and, and read additionally about it, they're looking only for the pretty bottlenose dolphin. Why kill the rest of them? They, what's, what's stated by the Japanese government and the fishers, the fisher people who do this, is that they use them for food. That is incorrect. They have stockpiled plenty of meat that's never eaten. Most people in Japan are not eating dolphin meat. They're not. We know this from inside. And there are many groups in Japan that are working to stop these drive hunts. I think this has become a cultural practice now. And they don't want to be told from the outside to stop. I think this was one real problem with the cove. As much as we had hoped it would make a difference, the problem is that the, the Japanese government does not want to be told what to do. I think that's why change from inside is critical. And many of us are trying to support those inside Japan who are trying to make the change in their own country. Many people in Japan, just like us, want to stop these drive hunts. They love their pets. They love other animals. They love dolphins and whales. This is uh, an entrenched uh, practice by very few fisher fishermen. And uh, it's for profit. And there are aquariums that are still taking dolphins from these hunts and helping to support this within Japan and a few other countries. Doing some research for this uh, show, it seemed like there was a 
the, br the brutality, not just in Japan, but the brutality of fishermen as if the dolphin were a competitor, were a, were, were a villain. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what are we not seeing there from this side of yeah. the world? So there's a lot of overfishing in Japan and other countries as well. And um, we've investigated this. Others have published papers. On other, there are many scientific papers published on whether or not the dolphins are actually competing for fish, because this has been one of the claims of, of the fisheries department. It is not correct. The dolphins simply cannot consume enough fish to make it a problem. So they're being scapegoated. Mm. And I think, you know, it's a, this is a complex problem. We really need to take our science and have it transcend geographic boundaries. Science doesn't stop at, in different countries. Science is, our scientific findings are scientific findings. And what's so fascinating is that, you know, we think about translational science for biomed biomedical purposes. I think we really need to take our science and have it translated into policies, international policies. And this is really, dream, this is really a dream for a lot of us. So as people who have had the honor to work with these animals and the opportunity, I feel like it's really our responsibility to share this information and keep sharing it so we can make these changes. Diana, I'm so sorry. We are out of time. I hope you come back and talk about mm. other things. This has been so much fun. Thanks so much for talking with me about this. Great pleasure.